Hi, my name is Mark Evans, and I'd like to introduce you to a program I wrote called Harmonic Visualizer. As you can see here, I've got a zip file I downloaded from my website, and if we double click on that, then we get the application. Now, probably the first time that you open this application, a message will pop up saying that it's from an unidentified developer and Apple will refuse to open it. However, there is a workaround. Just right click on the application and hit open, and then a dialog will come up and you click open again. Now the application may take a little while to load, but when it pops up, you'll see a bunch of mysterious geometric figures. The inspiration for this program came when I was writing a paper about Messian's Tarangalila, and I hit a section which I felt was very octatonic in sound, but for which there didn't seem to be a particular octatonic collection that Messian was using consistently. Some of you may know that Messian can be a bit of a beast analytically, because while some of his music is very systematic, other times he's just composing intuitively, and it's not always clear which is which. My suspicion about this passage was that it was an intuitive one, probably because I'd spent days unsuccessfully trying to find a system behind it. And I realized I could write a program that would help me track intuitive and not entirely consistent use of octatonic collections. That original program was essentially this triangle on the left, with C diminished 7 on the top, C sharp diminished 7 on the bottom left, and D diminished 7 on the bottom right. Since octatonic scales combine two diminished seventh chords and exclude the third, we can think of the midpoints of the sides of this triangle as the locations of each octatonic collection. The idea of the program was that I could play back the Messian score and have a dot move around the triangle depending on which notes were playing at any given time. Thus, for instance, an F natural would push the dot towards the lower right-hand corner since that's part of the D diminished seventh chord whereas an F-sharp would push it towards the top corner since that's part of a C-diminished seventh chord. A passage in a particular octatonic scale would tend to move along the side in between the two diminished seventh chords that it consists of. Purely atonal music would tend to hang out towards the middle of the triangle, with no particular diminished seventh chord being any more important than the others. So I'm going to go ahead and load as a demo score the mess in that inspired this program in the first place. And then I'm going to hit spacebar to play it back and you can see how the dot moves around the triangle. To me this was a very convincing visualization. The dot seems to hang out mostly in the lower right-hand corner, and when it moves away from it, you can hear a tonal shift in the melody. For instance, toward the end, when repeated A's push the dot towards the top of the triangle. I should mention that there's an adjustable parameter at work behind the scenes here, which I call memory half-life. The idea is that once the note is done playing, it doesn't stop having an effect immediately, but instead fades away with an exponential decay. I think this is a decent model for the way that we hear. After all, an arpeggio sounds like harmony rather than a succession of single notes, because we keep the past in our head for a few seconds. If we go up to the options menu and choose set parameters, we can change the memory half-life, as well as the tempo of playback. So for instance, let's try setting the memory half-life to 0.01. This way, almost immediately notes fade from memory. As you can see, the result is that the dot simply moves from corner to corner, since each individual note is located in only one position. The only exception would be a chord, the position of which is simply the average of its constituent notes. On the other side of the coin, we can make the half-life long, like 6 seconds. In this case, after a while, the dot begins to move very slowly as it's weighed down by the inertia of past information. Having created the octatonic triangle, I realized that augmented triads are also a division of the octave into equal parts. Of course, since there are four augmented triads, there would have to be four corners, and if I wanted to make them truly independent, I would need to have a three-dimensional tetrahedron. And as you can see, that's what I created. What's kind of fun about this is that I made it so that you can rotate the tetrahedron in three-dimensional space. I prefer not to think about whether that was worth the effort.
The music for which this diagram would be most appropriate would be anything that features a lot of major thirds or hall tone scales. And as you can see to the right of it, I have a line between the C hall tone scale and the D flat hall tone scale. I'm going to go ahead and load the second demo score, the second movement of Schoenberg's Opus 19, which I think fits the bill. One of the intriguing things about the augmented triad and whole tone diagrams is of course they're connected, since any whole tone scale is simply made up of two augmented triads. So in a way the C whole tone scale occupies a line between the C augmented and D augmented corners of the tetrahedron, while the D flat whole tone scale occupies the line between the D flat augmented and E flat augmented triads. Now you may be wondering about this circle of fifths on the right. After making the first three diagrams, I became curious what would happen if I used the same idea with a circle of fifths. Namely, every time we hear a C, the dot is pushed towards the C. Every time we hear a D, it's pushed toward the D, etc. I'll load up a Bach chorale to show you what it looks like. This is, I think, a more problematic diagram, because it's more ambiguous. A given point in the circle could be arrived at through different possible averages of different notes. However, I still think it's kind of interesting. Now, if you have perfect pitch, you may have noticed that a C major triad doesn't actually direct the dot straight to C. This is because the notes G and E, which are part of the triad, all lie to the sharp side of C. So a C major triad will push the dot somewhat to the sharp side of C, and also not quite to the edge of the circle, since their average lies in between. Likewise, the notes of a C minor triad are C, G, and E flat, which on average are to the flat side of C. For this reason, I've given the option down here of looking at the triad locations. And you can see when I click it that C major is to the right of where C was, and C minor is a little to the left of where C was. I'm going to go ahead and set the memory half-life to a tenth of a second so that the dot moves very quickly to the new chord. And we can watch the dot move around again, but this time with the positions of the triads on display. For those without perfect pitch, by the way, the chorale is in E minor. So that's the harmonic visualizer. I hope this was enlightening in some way, I thought it was kind of interesting. And you can go ahead and download it from my website if you'd like. I'm also including a link to the term paper on Tarangalila in case anyone's really masochistic. Thanks for watching.